And we are now live on YouTube. Let me post the link very quickly to the uh, pages on Facebook. And then we will go ahead and get started. Right, is that? Let me make sure that the link is working all right for everyone. Still there, John? You still there, John? Yes. Okay. Make it sure. Right. You didn't see a link posted. Close. All right. Uh, let me see. All right, we are live. Let's uh, get set to go here, folks. Hello, and welcome, everyone, to Full Surf Magic Live Q&A with Johnny Thompson. Uh, my name is Dr. J, for those of you who do not know me yet. And today, because we have such a legendary guest, uh, we will no doubt have many viewers and many questions for him. So today, we are going to deviate from our usual uh, format in that we will ask live questions first. And then at the end, if we have time, we will get to the devoted questions. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the master, the legendary Tom Sony, the godfather of magic, Mr. Johnny Thompson. Hey, hi, John. Hi, guys. How are you? Hello, everybody. It's great to have everybody here. Thanks for uh, joining us with John Thompson here. And I was uh, made aware earlier that his wife, Pam, is not feeling well, so she will not be joining us. But please accept from us uh, our uh, wishes for a speedy and full recovery. Uh, thank you. Yeah, she has a problem with a pinched nerve right now. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, I am going to be using two different uh, uh, two different uh, computers here. One for questions, one for video. So, if I'm not looking directly at you when I speak, please, my apologies. Accept them. And with that, uh, are we ready to go, Johnny? Yeah, I'm. I'm all set. All right. Awesome. Uh, the first question I have for you, um, let's start with, can you suggest any books on acting for magicians? Ah, yes. I studied with a woman named Uta Hagen, who was one of the greatest exponents of the method I ever met. And I, I managed to be with her one-on-one. -on -one. And she had uh, two books. The first book is called Respect for Acting, and I would suggest they read it because it's a, a course in a book, and she gives you things to rehearse, and, and what it will do is uh, help develop your personality on stage. You know, the hardest thing to find out about ourselves is who we are on stage. I always say this, oh, an act. Well, who are you on stage? Well, well, what's your character? You know, it's very easy for some people to say, oh, I just be me, you know, but we're never just me. You know, well, there's a facade there. We're, we're acting, and uh, the, the more magicians learn that they really are acting. We're doing something most actors can't do. We're lying while we're doing things that we say we're not doing, you know, and uh, doing secret moves as we're talking, and... It's a special gift of acting, and the more you can learn about acting, the better it is. But I would say Uda's book is really good. A lot of people recommend Stanislavski's uh, book. So, but and, you know, a good acting book would be your best bet. I really believe what Robert Houdin said. You know that uh, it's a magician playing the part. Uh, I mean, it's an actor playing the part of a magician. And then it was uh, masculine in our magic who made it even more poignant. He said, it's 
a, an actor playing the part of a great magician. Why would you play the part of just an ordinary magician? So, uh, yeah, I, I would say my, my best bet would be start with uh, respect for acting. And they say the second book she's done is even better. I just don't have the title on the tip of my tongue. Uh, that that's a very good answer, and uh, I leads me to another question. Uh, we're still kind of waiting for some to, to roll in here a little bit. Uh, touching on that acting uh, issue that a lot of magicians have uh, problems acting, but a lot of them have a problem lying to people. Do you have any advice to magicians on how to overcome those butterflies that they get from lying to people when they're well, you know brought up all your life? You don't lie. It's Hobson's answer. We're honest liars, you know. We tell people we're going to fool them, and then we do, you know. So uh, I don't know why you would feel guilty, or else why get in this business, you know, because one of the necessities of being a magician is to be able to be saying one thing while you're doing something else and uh, doing moves as uh, as Kanye put it, in transit actions, you know, where it looks like a normal action, but you're actually covering it with uh, with a move. And uh, Vernon, of course, we refer to it as being natural. And what he meant was being natural to your own moves, the way you, you handle cards and the way you cut them. If you're doing a secret move or a false shuffle, it must emulate the way you really shuffle, you know. And we're we're not just acting, but we're also doing the equivalent of acting with our hands, you know, saying we're doing shuffling cards, but we're really, really not. Mm -hmm. And our whole industry is based on acting. Now you're and doing what you're saying you're not that. doing. I'm sorry? It's almost a way of saying you're doing exactly what you're saying you're not doing. That's correct. <laughs> So, oh, that that. Thank you for that answer. Uh, next question for you, uh, leading on, is um, who or what inspires you to work in the field of magic? Well, to be honest, I I started out wanting to be a card cheater. When I was eight years old, I I wish I've been trying for years to discover the the uh, the picture I saw, but I saw a movie about a Mississippi riverboat gambler. It's been misquoted many times in the Hyla Clark book. They thought it was a, a movie called Mississippi River Boat Gambler, you know, uh, with Tyrone Power, but that was in the 50s. This happened to me when I was eight years old, which is 1942. But I saw a movie about a Mississippi River Boat Gambler. At least I think it was a Mississippi River Boat Gambler. I remember the Derringer hat and the frock coat and the brocade vest. Yep. And I said, that's what I want to be, a card cheater. And I went out and I found the only book I could find on card cheating, which was The Expert at the Card Table. And then I said, you know, it took me months just to figure out. I'm an eight-year-old kid and trying to figure out what an in-jog is, an out-jog. They didn't even call it card cheating in the book. They called it card table artifice or advantage play, you know. Yes. But I finally got through that. And I remember the first day that I was able to control a card and my father had no idea he just thought I was shuffling cards and all of a sudden I turned the top card over and it was his card and I realized <laughs> I had a little power here that my father couldn't understand you know <laughs> and uh, so I tried to master as much as I could uh, over four years uh, and uh, it ended up that uh, I came to the rude awakening after four years. There weren't a lot of places for a 12-year-old card cheater to work. So <laughs> I looked in the back of the book, and it showed you how to apply that uh, those moves to magic. First trick I actually did was the card through the handkerchief. Uh, and I was pretty adept at palming. I've always had large hands, so I always use poker-sized cards, and I was able to palm pretty well even as a kid. That's very unusual for... Uh, for uh, That's how I started. And then uh, I started hanging around magic shops because in Chicago there was Abbott's, uh, there was National Magic, there was Joe Berg's Magic, there was Ireland's Magic, Ireland. plus a couple of small shops. The first small shop I ever went to, uh, the, the guy behind the counter was a veteran from the Second World War and he had one arm, but he was doing all this magic with like Rene Levan with one arm. And then I went to the other bigger shops 
and uh, and because I could do things out of Bergen, I met Paul with Paul, I met Paul Rosini. Uh, my first job in show business was in a freak show, and one day standing out in front of the freak show doing the Erdenace one-hand cut, a guy walked up to me and said, where did you learn that, kid? And I said, oh, out of this book called Expert at the Card Table. And he introduced himself, and it was Louis Zangoni. Wow. In-laws owned a ski ball exhibit directly across from the freak show, or 10 and 1 show as they're called, you know, 10 attractions under one roof, uh, directly across from us. So I used to have lunch with them every day. I got lucky meeting some great magicians early in life because of Erd Nace. Well, that's very good, you know, and it's very unusual for the, the, the younger kids in, in magic to get taken seriously, you know, in anything that they're doing. Uh, most people think, oh, that's cute, it's just a phase, but for many of us, it's, it's not, you know, it becomes a, a lifetime fascination. Oh, I've been hooked on it since I'm eight, you know, and uh, when I got into the magic world, I remember walking into Abbott's the first time, and they had everything they had on display. Bold Productions, there was a Super X sitting there set up. There was illusions and close-up magic and counters full of magic and, and silks hanging from the ceiling. And I thought I walked into A Thousand and One Nights, Scheherazade for me. You know, it was, wow, this is this is what I want. No, that, that's, uh, I know that's a very good answer. I like that. Um... Uh, the next question is, uh, in your opinion, what is your most valuable mistake? My most valuable? Mistake. Uh, well, uh, the, the worst one that ever happened, <laughs> I was on a cruise ship, and I had met a harmonica player. You know, I used to be a harmonica player, and... Uh, so I met an old harmonica player I hadn't seen in years named Stan Fisher, a classical harmonica player. And we were on the same ship, and um, there was no crossover in the showroom. In other words, you couldn't get from stage right to stage left behind a curtain. Mm -hmm. So my wife, because we were the closing act on the show, had to go a half hour before the doors opened and sit in a, a compartment on the stage left side uh, of the stage where she could come in and out of that acted as a wing area. So that left me to load the birds up and I put them in the top drawer of uh, the dresser so I could just reach and grab them, you know, and, and load up. And my friend Stan Fisher called me and we started talking. And, and pretty soon he said, aren't you about due on stage? I said, oh yeah. I said, well, I plan to, you know, put the birds on and go out and so I walked out through the, entered through the audience, raised in my hand, did the cane, the table, set the hat down, produced the first silk, and there were no birds. Oh, I, I, I double checked, and I started doing knot tricks as I eased my way over to the wings. And you know, you have this kind of stage talk where you're smiling and you're really talking, kind of amateur vent on stage, the way to communicate. And I said, I had no birds. And my wife said something with an expletive attached to it. Saying, I had no blankety blank what? And I said, bring me anything that doesn't take a bird. I had a late magician later say, what did you do? I said, 35 minutes. But oh, in other words, we just, stuff we planned to do on a second show, we just threw in right there. To, 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 to coin a phrase, you winged it, pun intended. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you know, you, you you panic for a second, but then you go into gear and you, you're a professional. I, I'm one of those who believes people don't want to see a magician screw up a trick just like they don't want to see a juggler drop a ball, you know. so, And, and I'm one who really believes in that adage, you know, since they don't know what you're doing, you can get away with murder as long as... I, in fact, I find... A real professional magician is a guy who knows how to get out of trouble because it's easy to do what we do when it's all going well. But yep. when it's not going well, you've got to keep that facade going and uh, and work everything out right on stage. And I, I, have, I consider myself pretty good at getting out of trouble, which probably means I'm not that good a magician because I keep getting <laughs> into trouble, but I do get out of trouble. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, see, that's the most important thing in Andy. Get out of it, right? You know, that's uh, without anyone really knowing. There they go. There you go. Um, you know, and it, it, it's interesting to point that out because that's one of the things that many magicians fail to do is uh, realize that at points they can get into trouble and they go into a show unprepared, uh, you know, and they get stuck like a deer in the headlights. They have nowhere to go with something when it screws up, you know. Well, you know, I have two of every prop. When I was a boy in the, in the late 30s and early 40s, I read the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the magic section was written by John Mulholland. Mm -hmm. In there, he said he always had a second set of props in the wings in case something broke. And that became my Bible. And I have two of everything, two canes, two, uh, two extra top hats, two sets of silks, two sets of bird harnesses. If a wire breaks, I can just go over and pick up one from in the same position. For, so I was a big, big believer in that. I met Mahalan in the late 60s, and I told him about it, that this was my credo. And he said, oh, I never really did that. And I went, what? <laughs> 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 you talk about something you didn't do, and then you say you didn't do it. Wait a minute, you know. That's but, a magician. That's a magician. Yeah, but you know what? For me, it was the best advice in the world. I think he did do it at one time, but as he got older, he was what he was really saying. He just stopped doing it. He was confident. But I just always believed in that, and I still do, and I have two of everything. Yeah. Including your sets of tails and my wife's dresses and everything. Oh, and it's funny. I just uh, touched very quickly on that. Benson Kentley uh, uses some very flashy shorts in his acts, and he always gets the funniest looks from the people at the counters when he's buying three of the same shirt at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next question for you I have is Can you please I have one speak? addition to that? It's yes. What Charlie Miller told me. He said, if you find something that works, buy as many of them as you can because eventually they're going to go out of business and not be manufactured. And boy, has that saved my neck a lot. That's oh, all. I close it off with that. Oh, yeah. Especially these days, you never know what's going to last. Yes. So, all right. The next question we have for you is, can you please speak about your approach and insights into the art of performing magic comedy silently. That is from Jonathan Levy. Okay, well, you know, Keller's absolute perfect proof of someone who's made a living doing magic silently, never spoken once on stage, you know, as a performer. And uh, I, for a classical act, and especially an act that you want to be able to, to perform worldwide, then a pantomime act answers all of those questions. And to do it funny uh, even adds more. I, I was making a living in Vegas and uh, in corporate work when a lot of people couldn't with birds because I had a comedy act. And uh, initially I, I would use, when I worked at Playboy Clubs, I would use bunnies as assistants. And... Uh, then when I went to Vegas, I used showgirls as assistants, and then eventually my wife joined the act, and, and the money doubled overnight because she was equally as funny as I was. But to to do pantomime, uh, it's a it's a different it's sight comedy. It's a totally different thing than uh, than doing, you know, talking comedy, and it, it registers. And I have always said. If you're doing it correctly, the audience is just ahead of you, apparently, in knowing where you're going. And if you can sell that, you know, uh, they, they're they anticipating what you're thinking. And uh, then I know I'm doing a really good job. Uh, I learned pantomime. I worked with a, a dwarf named Johnny Paleo, a little person, as they prefer to be called. And uh, Johnny Paleo was a brilliant pantomime artist with an act called Born Minovich's Harmonica Rascals. And he was just brilliant. And I, I learned about talking in a Soto voice back and forth, which a lot of people don't realize to get realism. You, 
you you um, I turn and talk to Pam back and forth is, and uh, it just helps you uh, along with the pantomime you know if you but uh, people don't realize what we're saying but they can see there's things going back and forth and then you learn to not talk and just do it with looks um, but um, it's it, it's a lot of work to do pantomime but uh, there, you know, there's the classical school of Marcel Marceau, but I come from the Sagata school or realistic school. Red Skelton did Italian Sagatas. Yes. And the, the difference about a Sagata is you tell them what you're doing. For instance, Red Skelton, this, this is a routine about a, dent, a dentist going underseas to fix a, a whale with a toothache. And now everything he does, you quite understand. Or this is a, a Greek waiter preparing a salad, and when he cuts his thumb off and all the gags that go on, you understand it immediately. Well, you don't have that advantage of doing the cigar or telling the story, right. but realistic mime allows you to, to do the setups between both uh, your partner and yourself, unless you're doing it. George Carl was a perfect example I, I don't know if you know who George Carl was, but yes, he was a great pantomime com comedian who had one of those great faces, and that's what it takes. And I've been lucky uh, myself. Uh, I, I've got a good face for doing takes, but it's <laughs> an art form unto itself, and 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 you have to you have to go to school and learn it. And there are mime schools, and you know you should take a little classical mime to understand it, and then go from there. But realistic mime is what I do. Yeah, that that's uh, that mime is very uh, hard. Myself, I come from uh, as a student of Marcel Marceau. Uh, he introduced me to the work of George uh, that you mentioned, and uh, and then there's of course uh, Tony and Karen Montanaro uh, here in the mm -hmm. United States. And there's uh, Marcel was uh, Marcel was always con. Uh, telling people to broaden your horizons. If you study mime, that's kind of, you know, broaden your horizons uh, across the many different types of mime. Don't just focus on one. That's know. great. So, and, okay, I have another question. Uh, let me see. Um, yes. Can you tell some of us, uh, or I'm sorry, what are your thoughts on TV and YouTube magic? TV what? TV and YouTube magic. Well, I'm not a big fan of where a lot of magic is going because the videotapes are very good to teach one thing, timing. Mm -hmm. One thing you can't get from a book. But I'm a big believer in learning magic from a book. And I have to tell you, that's why you see every so often someone do a move that we all do, but they do it just perfectly, and you go, what am I missing? But it's that's what they got out of that book, you see. And, and if you listen to Vernon's naturalness, you 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 do it the way you, you handle things. Then it's going to look better. I'll give you an example. I got a pack of cards here. And uh, so... Vernon uh, shuffled cards like, can you see the tabletop? No, you'd have to put the screen down a little bit. Okay, how is, let me see if I can do that. A little, little, little bit more, almost there. All right. There, there you go. Okay. Well, Vernon shuffled cards like this, and everyone said, oh, well, look at how brilliant that is. He He's allowing the full deck to show. No, that's not the reason that happened. Vernon had a real job because mm -hmm. <laughs> he always said, be natural. Yes. Well, this was natural for Vernon because he only had a real job one day. His wife insisted he get a job, and he was an engineer. And Vernon was on a building they were building over the East River, and he saw a kid carrying a bucket of mercury and went to help him and slipped off the girder and fell 11 stories, broke his arms, his rib cage, and when he was in a coma and when they came out they were trying to put a pen in his mouth to amputate his arms to put an X 
And fortunately, he refused. And then Jacob Daly showed up as his doctor and refused, or else we would not have had a Dave Vernon, you know. Yeah. But because of that, his arms, when he did the balls in the net, he would swing his arms up like this, you know. Whereas uh, Oscar Platic invented a pop up move where he just did this to put the ball on because he, this was not natural for him. And then that's the, the real secret to be as natural with handling as possible and uh, do what fits you. And, then, uh, and when you do watch television, we get a lot of parrots, a lot of people who become Michael Amars or Daryls. And there's nothing wrong with that except it doesn't develop your own personality. And now we have a trait of people who seem to buy tricks and then want to do show how they do them on camera. I guess they don't have anyone else to share it with, so this is a way of doing it. And we have a lot of people putting out material right now that uh, not all of it is ingenious material, but they, it's the only way they can find fame, you know, because there's not much show business left. Yep. You've got to remember when I started in show business, I started in five-a-day theaters. Mm -hmm. five shows a day with a movie in between seven on the weekends. And uh, uh, and then there was nightclubs. And, uh, but there's not anywhere. Here in Vegas, you have to buy the room. They call it four-walling. Four-walling, yeah. They, call it, they pay for everything. They pay for the ushers, the advertising. They pay for the house crew, their own magic crew, sound men, lights. You know, so... Uh, it's a different show business. There's not a lot of places to work, so I understand why it's being done on television and so forth. And I guess uh, part of it is showing, well, here's what I do and here's how I do it to show at least that they're somewhat skillful. And magic is taking a turn towards being showing skillfulness. I was just at the Magic Castle Banquet and a young man from Korea who won Magician of the Year did a beautiful job but it was more magic for magicians as a card routine. It wasn't I'm producing cards out of the air. It's I'm showing my hands empty and then I'm showing you I've hidden cards somewhere is the impression I get. He does it beautifully and it's a great act for magic conventions. But I don't know if Lehman would appreciate it as much. But he's, he's a be beautiful technician, but it's not an act. And, uh, and I'm going to get critiques about it, but that's my own personal opinion, you know. And we have a lot of that happening these days uh, where it's pure skill that's being shown, you know, throwing cards. And uh, it, I come from that old school where you, you don't want anything. Charlie Miller, when he would shuffle a deck of cards, just did it like this, like some guy who can barely shuffle, you know, although he was controlling the cards. But... It, people never even thought twice about it, you know. And you can you can hold a pack of cards and you can just square them up. I just palmed the card, you know, but there should be no movement instead of this kind of thing where you, you know. And so magic for me is a hidden art form. Teller once said, the highest form of the art is not seeing the art. You know, it's hidden. Indeed. Yes, and that, that, that's uh, it takes you back that's to the problem I'm I'm having with with what's going on today. Especially, there are people who just do flourishes; they don't even do a trick, you know. And I guess that's okay. But I, I wouldn't call myself a magician. I would call myself a, a card juggler. And you, you, I, I, I think spreading the cards across the table is acceptable because they see it in casinos all the time. But I never get much more than that. I don't even run the card over the top to show how fancy that is, or two cards to split it. I, I just do, do minimal amount of flourishes, if any. I really don't do much. Somebody says, don't you do any false cuts? I went, only the ones that look like this, that look like a real cut. Then <laughs> that's about <laughs> as far as I'm going to go. And that's definitely a Marlo Slidini mentality is, you know, trying to convey that you are doing something normal without being show-off. Because yeah. the moment you do that, you ruin 
Arturo Ascanio called it in transit actions. Yes. You move while you're apparently putting a deck over here. Vernon called it naturalness in, in making the moves natural to your own actions. And I love Slidini's definition, just plain not showing off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. But we're talking about the masters, and the, we don't have people in moving in those skill schools much anymore. Exactly. Um, listen, I was the luckiest man in the world to have Charlie Miller as my house guest for 12 years, like family, and and spend the years. I, my first session with Vernon was when he was 75, and then I spent 23 more years with him. I thought I was so lucky to have a session before he died, and then he lived 23 more years, and I garnered so much knowledge. And probably uh, he was the greatest sleight of hand exponent in our industry from time in memoriam, and uh, Charlie wasn't bad either. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I'm sure Charlie will be glad to hear that from you. Yeah, well, Charlie was <laughs> the best magician I ever knew, all around magician. That's why I call myself a general practitioner. It's a term that Carol Fox and I coined, but Charlie fit that bill, and I feel I fit that bill. I made my living at every form of magic from bar magic to comedy magic to a straight dove act to illusions, trade shows. Even was a sword swallower and fire eater on my first job as a kid. Mm. Well, that that kind of leads me to the next question, and the uh, question is, how did you get uh, into consulting for magician and for TV magic? Well, consulting work, I fell into it. You know, um, the, f the first thing that happened is I met a young man in 1980 at Joe Stevens' last convention in Wichita. The show, the last show, consisted of Marvin and Carol Roy, Pam and myself, and David Copperfield. That was the whole show. It was a pretty strong show. But there was a young man named Lance Burton that I met there. And he came to my room and wanted to learn to do Channing's uh, Dove to Silk routine. And we started and we talked about, I told him how to take a normal coat if you have to buy one and and, and doctor it for a magic coat. You know, you, you for doves, you buy it size larger. You use double the the uh, 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 shoulder pads. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that gives you height if you want to carry birds higher. And then you have it taken in about an inch and a half uh, at the waist, and you get the kind of 40s, look, see, uh, both Channing and I were doing birds in the 40s, and we both bought what was the tuxedo of the time. It was a Zutsu tuxedo. Yes. And we talked about this, and because of the cut, it allowed you the extra room in here to handle birds. And so, uh, uh, so I started with Lance. He came out to the West Coast, and he told me one day he was watching me at the Magic Castle, and we went outside and we're uh, relaxing for a minute between shows and he said, oh, Jay Marshall said I should not just do a zombie ball. And I, he said, I, I, so I'm thinking of floating the light bulb that's on top of my uh, lamp, lamp post. I said, that's a terrible idea. I said, I'll give you an idea I've had for years and I just never did it, which was a cylindrical cage and a white parakeet. I used to produce white parakeets. I, I think I started the trend. Well, actually, I got the idea from a magician named Howard Brooks. Howard Brooks was a comedy magician. He was the man who invented, uh, uh, oh, the watch with the, uh, you know, the, the uh, ruler coming out. He yeah. invented the bra trick. And uh, he was a comedy magician. And he invented the whistling belly buttons, if you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Where they would, have yes. guys they draw eyes here and and have a nose and and their na navel would look like a belly you know their belly button would look like a whistle and they were called the whistling belly buttons <laughs> first hey. on the ice capades. Anyway, in his act, he did an egg bag and he would switch the egg bag at the end and he'd say if anybody uh, 
wants to know how I reproduce the egg in the bag, I use a reproducer. And then he would take out a dove and say, this is the mommy. <laughs> and, the daddy. and then he would take out a white parakeet with its tail trimmed to look like a baby dove and say, and this is a baby from a previous marriage. <laughs> and I called Howard and knew him and he gave me permission to use white parakeets. So, uh, where in my act now, an egg drops, I used to crack it open and produce a parakeet out of it. And uh, I gave Lance one of the routines I did, which is where he takes a, a napkin and tears it up and, and, and it becomes a parakeet that goes up his arm. Well, that came out of my original straight act. And nice. we used different methods, but the effect was the same. And uh, so... I'm kind of off the beaten track here of what the original question was. Uh, it was, uh, how did you get into consulting? Oh, yeah. So, anyway, okay. <laughs> so, Lance, he came out to the West Coast, and uh, and we started working on his act. And, I, and he was using multiple red, white, and black silks. And, and so, I, I said, why don't you go monochromatic, just one color. And, uh, oh, and when I, I, after I met him the first time, I saw him a year later, and now he had jet black hair and white makeup, and I said, what's going on, Lance? He said, well, I just saw um, Dracula with Frank Lynch, <laughs> going to be a vampire magician, and we even talked about trying to get starlings, you know, because ravens are too big, and crows are tough, and but uh, so when it came to the, the, the color, I said, why don't we use purple? That's what Edgar Allan Poe called the habitaments of the grave, and they use it yes. the Requiem High Masses. And, yes. and you'll know it's vampirish, even though the end. And so that's how the purple came about. And But we worked on the act, and one day I saw him, I said, Lance, you're doing my bird steal. He said, well, John, I watched you. And, and, and we, we went over that, a little few corrections. And one day he fooled me with the pack of cards. He says, oh, well, I kind of borrowed that from the way you get at the egg. And so we started working on his act. And he wanted to go to fish him. And, uh, and we developed a really great professional act. And of course, he was the first American magician. And that was my first kind of payback for everyone who was so kind to me because, as I said, I had Vernon and Charlie Miller and Paul and Paul and Rosini and all these great magicians, Joe Berg, they were all very kind to me. And uh, so I thought it was time to pay back. And then Lance, uh, we started, he wanted to do a, a, a routine with a card sword. So Max Maven had suggested he do a card sword and only do one card and it really looks real, you know, and I said, well, he's got a great idea. And I said, I have an idea for a, a card sword because everyone I see always looks so so weird. They don't look like a real sword. But people will accept a buccaneer's hilt, you know, the type yeah. that protects your whole hand. And I said, I know Owens makes them for sword baskets, and we could put two together and make it hollow and and do a car. And so that 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 we did. And then I said, if we're going to do a sword, let's do a sword fight. And it went for there. And originally, my idea was I did the world's largest temple screen with Lance and the guy with sword fighting around it, and we had a girl hidden behind it, and there was going to be a girl in the act. But it wasn't playing that well, and Lance finally came up with the idea of taking the old cremation table with a black art drop behind it and making the switch there. And, of course, it turned the trick into a great trick. But that was the first thing I worked with him on. And then as the show progressed, uh, uh, he brought me on to work on certain things and then finally put me on salary, you know, a retainer. And, and uh, so... Uh, with that, anything I developed was Lance's, you know, and uh, and it that's how I got into consulting originally was just to help him with his show, and then Penn and Teller saw what I was doing and they contacted me. I, I didn't go out looking for it, you know. <laughs> they came to me and I remember the very first time uh, they showed me a trick they wanted me to work on. It was their blood trick, you know, where they yes. 
they held, had two people on stage hold up a towel and they took off their clothes and just put, showed them to these two people. They were totally nude and then put on T-shirts and then did a trick with, oh, if Penn produced a red silk, Keller would just produce red blood, you know, and it was a whole blood, blood. So I watched him and afterward I said, that's not very good. And Penn started laughing. I said, why are you laughing? And he said, because no one's ever said that to us before. <laughs> and I said, well, you don't want me to take your money and pat you on the head, you know. And that was the start of it. And then I worked on a seance piece with them that was quite unusual. And uh, then over time, I would, they would bring me in on special things. And eventually, they put me on salary. And I've been working with them for about the last 15 years. I started with them when they were at the MGM Grand. The, I mean, at Bally's. Then they went to the MGM Grand. And then finally, they've been 13 years now at uh, at the Rio. At the Rio, yeah. And of all the people I work with, they they're they're the most unique because it's all original material. It's even if it's something like Corinda's Powers of Darkness, we changed it as a two-person routine, you know, and 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 made it a totally different routine than what's out there. Uh, so it's it's really interesting, and they make me really work hard. But uh, it, <laughs> I, I've learned how to get into other people's heads because. Working for Chris Angel is different than working for Lance Burton, and working for Lance Burton is different than Penn and Teller. Mm -hmm. Or my, I have a mentalist I do a game show with uh, out of Thackerville, Ho Oklahoma. The world's largest casino is there, a supermarket and a gas station. That's it. Wow. <laughs> but but we, <laughs> we do a game show where we give away $150,000 in cash to a quarter of a million dollars sometimes, plus a couple of cars. And the first time we did it, we broke the house record in the amount of money. It was so ast astronomical, I can't mention what it is, but we've broken the record eight times. We're the biggest thing they have now. And so I, I just fell into consulting. I don't know if it's a thing you can learn. All I can tell you is I, I've got 71 years of experience in magic behind me. And the fact that I've made my living in every facet of it, uh, I, I can think and invent illusions or alter illusions that have been done one way. And uh, I understand comedy magic. I understand working behind the bar. Uh, and uh, I was a bar magician in Chicago for many years. I worked for Jack Murray. Even when I was a kid, I, I worked for Matt Shuline. Somebody said, how could you work a bar for Matt Shuline? I said, I didn't. He had a a Sunday brunch downstairs in a banquet room and um, I do that for my lunch sometimes and uh, but I, I, I really have made my living in every facet show business. The only thing I haven't done is sing and dance and do magic. <laughs> You're lucky I don't do that because I don't sing. <laughs> and I, it is very hard. I think it just comes down to having the experience. You can't consult uh, without having done it before, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So, no, you know, and it, it's it's a thing where that's why my book is is, is going to be a book about a lot of different things in magic because it's everything I've ever done, and it includes stage and close up and doves and comedy and so forth. So, uh, it, it's. There's a lot of people who are now calling themselves consultants. I mean, it just happened to me. But I, I, it's something that people who I know can, can do it, like Jimmy Steinmeier. And there are people out yeah. there who are great consultants and have, have done it even longer than I have. But it's it's something special, you know. You, you've got to have pretty well-rounded training. Yes. But, uh, Laura asked very quickly, can you do your Die Vernon impersonation? Absolutely, young man. Laura, I don't know who you are, but you're not a young man. But uh, I'm getting a little senile these days. You know, it's hard to keep coming back from, from uh, where I am at this point. But it's nice to hear from you, and it's awfully nice to see Dr. J. And I'm here with uh, my dear friend, Jeff McBride, who I've known for several years. And he's quite a clever young man. So I certainly hope... Uh, uh, it's nice that you brought me back. Thank you, darling. 
That was fantastic. If anybody's ever seen the depression, that that was perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, do you have any Max Bellini impersonations? I I do Max's uh, 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 opening phase in my cup and ball routine. And he had some interesting things. Now, you have to understand, Max had this guttural European sound. Mm -hmm. Now, my voice is two decibels under a sissy, for God's sakes. (laughs) So <laughs> to, to get down there, it's it's hard for me. But uh, but I will give you some of his actual patter. And Max Mullaney would open by saying, "Good evening, ladies, gentlemen. My name is Max Mullaney. You probably heard of me." If somebody said no, he said, "Well, I guess you don't get out much." <laughs> I'm going to do a trick with three cups and three balls. This trick is so old; it's older than God. <laughs> he meant to say Jesus the first time he did it, Charlie told me, but it came out God and got a laugh, so he always kept it at God. <laughs> but uh, he was cool, quite a character, a wonderful magician. Yes. Well, I, I, I would love to have seen him, but actually, in, in essence, I did see him. Charlie, de- his deportment was exactly like Max's. He yes. knew almost well, just about Max's home. He's passed on most of Max's material to me. And uh, there were four of us who took care of Charlie Miller. It was Ricky Jay, Steve Freeman, Percy Diaconis, and myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job was that he had a family. He lived with us and ate with us. And and Steve was his accountant. And Ricky and Percy always found ways to get him work and money and things like that. So we all took care of him. But Charlie was uh, the epitome of Max. He could do anything Max Mullaney did and did it beautifully. Wonderful. So if you saw Charlie at all, you were seeing a lot of Max Mullaney. Well, thank you for that. Nick uh, Young said he just uh, fell out of his chair laughing. <laughs> um, well, of course, you know, Max and I didn't get along too well. He got a little angry about me doing the card stab. Even though it came from Erdnace, he wasn't quite sure of that, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic, yes, yes. Um, well, uh, let's go back uh, just a little bit here. Uh, what do you consider to be your greatest professional accomplishment? Um, well, some of the stuff I'm doing right now as a consultant, I just did um, a show with Todd Robinson Teller. They, they wrote it, Teller directed it, Todd starred in it, and we took... Uh, a, a 30s, 40s, and 50s old spook show and updated it with serial killers and Marjorie from the uh, Houdini fame and uh, Yusefia Palladino, one of the early psychics before they were called psychics at the turn of the last century. And uh, we made it a really spooky, frightening show and it was very successful. And I think I developed some of the best magic I've ever developed. In fact, uh, we just did it at the Geffen Theater a, a couple of months ago, and I uh, was fortunate enough to win the L.A. Drama Critics Circle Award for Illusion and Magic Design. And uh, I really do think we've come up with some of the best magic that was ever put into a show. It fooled a lot of a lot of my friends went and saw it and had no idea how most of it was done. I had John Gahn call me and say, you fooled me with this and you fooled me with that. And I sent him an email back saying, I'm glad to hear that because you've been selling me the same things for about 35 <laughs> years. And he laughed about it. Uh, so. Oh, you got to think the name he just meant, John Gahn, he's uh, a big illusion builder. Um, well, probably the premier illusion builder, I have to say. He, he was yeah. the guy who who turned illusion building around. Prior to that, it was uh, the Owens uh, company built the best illusions. Carl Owens was, and John Daniels, of course, was marvelous. And he updated most of the stuff there. And then John, uh, I think right now, is still the premier uh, builder. My goodness, when I go into a shop, and I see his recreation of the Turk. And he called me up. He was in Vegas. The Turk was a chess-playing automaton. It was a fake yeah. automaton. It was a magic trick. And I saw him do it for a chess convention. 
And I have to tell you, it's a fooler, and I imagine in 1860 this was a real foolery because it still is today, you know. Oh, yeah. You cannot believe there was another chess player underneath working at, you know, you know uh, with little rods and things. It was amazing. There was a question a bit ago. I'm not sure if it pertains to cards, and I'm going to assume it does, not silks or anything else. But uh, what is your favorite color change to use? My fa fa favorite color change? Yes. Well, I have several. One is a silk color change that um, I, uh, I, I, in my straight act when I was a kid, I, I developed a routine where. I started smoking at 12, a big mistake, by the way, and because by, by 20, by 13, I was up to four packs a day, and by 24, I had a spot on my lungs. Mm -hmm. and that's probably why at my age now I have COPD, you know. But in those days, I would, um, I would have a candle. This is a trick I had until I saw it was in Del Rey's act before me, and then I took it out. But it was a pretty trick. I had a, an Okito color-changing candle. I used to light up a cigarette, and as I blew the match out, the candle would light. Then I would take a drag off, and I'd blow smoke, and the candle would change from white to red. Mm -hmm. It's really, the Okito candle's amazing. And, uh, and then I would uh, reach in my pocket and take out a white silk and stretch it between my hands, and I held it at my fingertips and just shook it, and it changed completely to from white to red and then uh, I would have a white bird I would cover and I'd whip the, the silk off and throw it in the air to show there's nothing in it and the bird would change to red it was a whole sequence and um, so that was my favorite color change sequence but uh, with cards uh, I, I like the Erdnase color change very much where you Rub your hand on the front of the face card and it changes. It's a very beautiful change. But I also do one of Charlie Miller's. Let me see if I can still do this. This is a, a kind of a, a pretty color change. Let me see if I Yeah, I got a nice color here. But this is Charlie's color change where you just snap the card like that and it changes color. Very nice. Yeah, it's really nice. And it's just the Hofsinger snap change done visibly so you see it happens. That's one of my other favorite color changes. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, it's kind of funny when you, you talk about, uh, you know, doing stuff like that. There's a, a lot of stuff that's out there. There's different ways of doing it. Um, you know, what, what, what uh, is your input or your, your, in, your, your take on the, uh, the lack of creativity in magic today? Well, I, there's a lot of creativity, but there, there's a lot of... Origin let, let me rephrase that to the word originality, not necessarily creativity. Okay. Originality. Well, you know, Eugene Berger is, is one who early in his career was always stressing to be original. But the truth is, when you start out in magic, you're going to emulate somebody. Mm -hmm. You have to. You can't just walk into this industry and be a genius and be doing original material. But sooner or later in your, your early stages, you realize if this is truly an art form, then you have to be to bring you, yourself to it. You know, there are painters. I, go, I, I used to go to the Prado when I was in Spain, and there'd be people copying masters to see their techniques and that. But eventually... You can't sell, you're only going to be a second rate, you know, Michelangelo, or it's like people who were copying Channing Pollock. They were never going to be Channing Pollock. They were going to be a second, you know, rate. Whoever they were. Yeah. And there were a lot of second rate Channing Pollocks. Like there were a lot of second rate Cardinis. But the guys who get the money are, are the important ones, you know, and... Uh, so originality is is a very important thing, and it's what 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 allows you to say you're an artist if you can really in, in influence your own magic with your own ideas, and even if it's a classical trick. I mean, those who make the difference. Vernon never really invented many tricks, but he improved almost everything he touched and turned it into a classic. 
and and that's with just original thinking about how to apply that trick to what he feels is good magic. And so it, that's a tough thing. It, it takes experience. First, you learn, get your chops. Once you have your chops up, you learn all the moves and, and learn. I always take someone's trick and learn it exactly the way they they taught it to me or explained it to me. And then I, I I work on it to see what I can add to it. What can I give it that makes it mine? And that was an old thing that Marlowe used to tell his students when, when you're trying to do something, you know, learn it the way it is, as is, or originally, and then you can start putting your spins on it. Work it backward, work it forward, upside down, and every which way. Never settle for, um, what was the word, uh, mediocrity. Always. Yeah, well, maybe that's why Ed had 142 methods for every trip. Yes, yes. <laughs> Typical Marlowe. You show him one thing, or well, here's seven more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, or, or Larry Jennings. Larry, if you could do a move with one move, Larry would add nine, you know, yes. just to make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. uh, But originality is what makes the difference. That's what makes, when you look at all the top flight professional performers, Juan Tamariz in close up or uh, Channing Pollock as a stage. I mean, they're all, you know, ch the guys out of out of the uh, Chavez course that became famous were all guys who took the knowledge and changed it. Uh, Norm Nielsen, who ended up doing a musical magical act. Channing Pollock, who did Birds. Uh, uh, Don Don Allen, who Don Allen. Yep. specialized in close-up magic, but they all studied with, uh, you know, Chavez and, uh, and Neil Foster, who was one of their teachers. Norm was a teacher. Channing was a teacher as well, you know. But they all, the ones who really got successful, broke away from the standard Chavez act and, and developed their own. Uh, I wanted to ask you very quickly because you were describing your silk color change with the uh, the the snap and the changes yes. visually. Uh, that that reminded me of your inclusion in the book called "Slice of Mind" by Marta, uh, by uh, Susana Martinez Conda and her husband Stephen Macknick. Um, how did you get involved in that book? In, in which book? "Slice of Mind." I don't know if I got involved in that. I remember part. that you were meant. You were. Uh, they, they described a part of you were uh, between you and Pam, uh, in the act of the way it worked uh, with the, the 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 science and neurology behind it and things like that for the percep perception of the audience. Um, and if you don't remember, I'll just move on. Yeah, I mean, I guess it was put in the book, but I don't even know if I have sleight of mind. Uh, or no, just, maybe I gave an interview or something, and it ended up in the book. But what what did it discuss? Uh, oh, wait, wait a minute. We have it right here. Thank you. What the neuroscience? <laughs> oh, I I understand this. This was the the uh, Susanna Martinez Gandhi. Yes. yes. Well, yeah, I, I got a little upset with them because. We we did we tell her and Apollo and um, Matt King and I, I think, and, uh, we we all did a show for them and we explained certain things, but when they put this book out, they also didn't they did things that they didn't tell us. For instance, they thought they knew how one of my effects worked, so they described an effect where I had twelve decks of cards, and so and it wasn't true, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and and so I was a little upset that they would think that they could figure out what we were doing just from watching us, you know, and getting some insight. I mean, I did tell them about a color-changing dress that I developed. Uh, that was. Uh, a version of the retention of vision, but done as an illusion. And uh, what I did is I, I had my wife in a white dress, and she had a blonde wig and white skin, and she would be standing six feet in front of a black curtain. Well, I had a tube. They even got this wrong. They thought everything was sucked down into the floor of the stage. 
but actually I had a black art tube coming from between the curtains to her back and a bungee cord hooked to the back of her dress that went through that to a stage hand that was pulling on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And the whole dress was an ampere dress that had folds, but they were just, it was wide open in the front. It just folded in against itself. Mm -hmm. and between the, 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 the bra area, I just took a, a, um, a door hinge and put the door hinge pin in with a line. So I would say on the count of three, that dress is going to change to any color called out by anyone. Then people would yell out all kinds of colors, you know. <laughs> and then on a break, I would say red, you know. And uh, as I'd say the dress is going to change from white to vi vibrant red without the use of any covers or magic boxes or cloaks. And then I would go one, two, three, and they the lighting director would go from a white spot to black for a fraction of a second and then to red. And what happened is the spotlight around her looked like it went to like maybe uh, the gel frame kicking in, but it was actually you were still seeing her image mm -hmm. because of the retention of vision, and then it turned to red. And during that little bit of blackness, the dress went... <laughs> And of course, the, in in red, it looked like the white dress just was with the red gel on it. And then I say, "Oh no, you're laughing, but that dress is really red." And the lights would come up, and she'd be wearing a red dress. And uh, that was one of the things I gave them based on retention of vision of the brain. Uh, but they decided to try and figure out how I did. And they did it to everybody, you know, figure out how they did certain things that we didn't talk to them about, except we told them what the principle was. So I was a little upset with that. Yeah, I know the book you're talking about. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I figured I didn't know I it was going to be open to the public because I, I corrected them and then found out it was going to the public. I said, well, if you're going with the public, go back with your own crazy idea of how I did it. Please don't put what I really told you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it still ended up being, for those who are interested in the subject, it's still a very educational book. Uh, and, I, and I think the, uh, any magician's interest in, in stage work or or whatever should read that. Mm -hmm. you get a better yeah, understanding of how but, but it, you know, it was one of these instances we gave them a little bit of information and they kind of felt like they know more than we do. Unfortunately, that's what it ended up being, yes. <laughs> that's Jeff McBride laughing in the background. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, next question for you is... Uh, gee, oh, this is a good one. This will be a really good one for you. Uh, for any of you who have seen uh, the the great Tom Sonia, which is now officially retired, um, what no, is it like? On. Not officially retired. Just that bird act and the bowling ball trick. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. I may, uh, stand corrected. Um, and it's almost unfortunate for those who haven't seen it because it was a great bit. Uh, and to that end, I would ask you, what is it like working with him? Oh, well, I will tell you what happened. Um, <laughs> I was working Vegas, and this was 1976, or 75, and we, we had a, um, a strike. And I got a call from my agent that Bill Larson wanted me to do the Academy Banquet that year because Cary Grant was supposed to do a, a gag magic act with Joan Rivers, and Joan at the time got a real job and canceled out, and they offered him other people like Rosemary from the Dick Van Dyke show and that, but he was afraid to do it with anyone else because he rehearsed it with her. Mm -hmm. So they needed a comedy magic act, and he had me to come, ask me to come out because I was headlining in, uh, in the Aladdin showroom at the time. All right, no, I think I was at the Flamingo. We moved the show. But anyway, uh, we were in the middle of a strike, and my assistant left town. So I said to Pam, you have to do the act with me. And she had done it on two other occasions, but this time the act was flushed out a lot more. So, And I'm not a big rehearsing guy, so I told her while we were driving, we met as actors. We, my wife was uh, 
kind of she played opposite Van Johnson and McDonald Carey. People, young people would know, but Bob Crane from Hogan's Heroes, for, right. not in his videos, by the way. But uh, and um, that's how we met, working with Bob Crane, and uh, he played Cupid for us. Uh, but anyway, on this job, we were using acting terms, subtexting. I told her what was going on in my head while I was doing the act, and what I thought the assistant would be doing and going on and then we got there and Channing Pollock was there and all my friends and Channing had you know I called uh, called him to get permission to do three tricks of his because the Tom Sony act is a parody of all the guys who did Channing's act who didn't have his looks and made mm -hmm. up for it with sheer arrogance you know and so, <laughs> so it was a nice comedy setup and we went out and did it, and I wasn't looking at her, but I was getting laughs in places that weren't laughs before. It was filling up all the empty spots, and I didn't know what she was doing. But after the show, Steve and Edie Lo Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet came backstage and said, "Oh, we want you to open for us." And, and I turned to her and I said, "Tell Bob Crane you're doing one more show with him, and then we're doing an act together." Mm -hmm. And then we really worked on it, and she, my money doubled overnight because we became a team, and uh, and we were very unique. There was nobody doing what we were doing together, you know. And we took the laurel on hard. There's a straight man and a comic approach, like Abbott and Costello, but we took the laurel and Hardy approach of two two people who are dependent on each other, one thinking they were brighter than the other. <laughs> But in reality, they, they're in the same bag, you know. And Laurel Hardy's approach was always better than just a straight man in the comic. And that was what we based our work on. Well, I think, uh, and again, going back to that act between you and Pam, it was always very funny to watch because you always played off of each other, uh, you know, almost like it was unscripted. You know, it was well, just in the moment. It changed a lot, believe it or not. You know, when you're doing an act with animals, livestock, it's always a little different anyways because the birds are moving on you and you've got to make adjustments. And uh, But being married and working together, we really think alike quite a bit. And we became a great team because of that. And uh, I always knew that if I was in trouble, she'd be looking for a way to help me get out. Or she saw me, you know, and I'm one of those guys who his material, uh, we have about two and a half hours of material. That's why we went on the cruise ships, because we never got a chance. We always did the same act in Vegas, you know, mm -hmm. the, a monologue in the bowling ball. But on the cruise ships, we could do two one-hour shows without repeating any material. And... Uh, we we do have uh, that kind of thing, and I'm one of those performers. If a situation comes up that I have a piece of material that fits it perfectly, I may just throw it in at that point. And my wife had to learn to get used to that—that that I would juxtaposition our, our our material sometimes, and then it really looks ad lib, you know. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that. That's a great answer. Um. Let's see, the next question I have uh, kind of goes back to the TV magic a little bit here. In your opinion, do the producers of TV shows have too much pull when it comes to what is done on camera? That's becoming something that's happening now. You know, since reality TV, they start feeling they can, they have a little more power than they used to. Uh, you know, when I w would go on a show, yeah, they would say, oh, we don't like this joke for our particular show. Would you mind taking it out? That's one thing. But when they start telling you, you know, take this out, take that out, we don't care for it, pretty soon you don't have an act, you know. And uh, that seems to be happening a little bit now. Uh, I, 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 I worked with somebody who was on America's Got Talent and... Uh, we delivered the prop in a day and a half uh, when, when nobody else could do it. And then I, I had a suggestion for the, the fellow's closing show. And But but the network said, oh, no. that And, and I think he would have won had he used it. 
believe it or not. It was a pretty good trick. Uh, but the producers have that say so, and if you want to be on television, especially in a reality show, uh, you've got to do what they want because there aren't any really re they're all scripted, whether it's just off the top of the producer's head saying do this and do that or have a fight with this person. But it really is. It's just that they don't have to hire real writers. There you go. I'm still mad at the writers for the Writers Guild, which brought on reality TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Les Miller asked a question for you. He uh, says he does your pen knife trick. Is that... Something you remember? What? Your pen knife trick. Yes. Okay. Uh, he says knives. Is that what he's saying? Uh, well, let me read it. Uh, he says I still do his pen knife trick, but I cannot seem to find the miniature pen knives for the ending. Ah, uh, yes. Any tips on where to find them? He says you perform this in your entertaining close-up magic, 1995. That's correct. Which I do remember. And, uh, it's, uh, Arturo Ascanio's finish for the color-changing knives. Yes. In the end, he takes a knife that's been changed several times, uh, and uh, when he pushes it in, he says it will change to any color you call out, and when they call out, the, the, let's say purple, he opens his hand, and he's got about 30 or 40 knives, and he <laughs> takes out the purple one and sets it down and dumps all the others. You know, it looks like the one knife transforms. Um, yeah, I, 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 the, the set I have was given to me by Arturo Escaño. In fact, I have his set of color-changing knives. He gave it to me. He said, I'm never going to be doing them again. And it was an honor to receive them. And uh, they were actually made for him by Juan Tamarit. And uh, uh, I don't know where you can get those little ones. You know, you might check with Joe Moger here. I think he does have a source. Uh, I believe Joe Moger sells a set of small knives. Yeah, because nowadays That's most people are familiar with, with Moger's, uh, Moger's uh, craftsmanship with the knives. That he uh, is probably probably the biggest dealer of the, uh, the sets out there today. So yeah, He is, and I believe he does make a set of small knives. Now, they may only be six or eight you get. You may have to get a couple of sets from them, but I know he does make them. Very good. Very good. Um, I know in the beginning we did ask you about uh, thoughts on acting books for a position, but let's yeah. go back to magic now. Uh, what books do you recommend, magic books, uh, do you recommend for beginners? Well, if we back to uh, uh, kind of the acting thing as well, I would always say Henning Nelm's uh, book... Uh, Showmanship for Magicians. Showmanship for Magicians really has a lot of great information about how to structure an act. And uh, that's one of the important ones. Uh, I, I'm a, a full believer of this. You start with conjuring principles first. Learn conjuring, you know, sleight of hand and cups and balls and uh, all the co coin magic and card magic and because you you garner all of the principles of magic and then you can move on to stand-up work and then from stand-up work to stage work the last thing you learn is illusions and that's a mistake people get into illusions these days because they think this is where the money is but what can you add to an illusion but subtlety? And when I say subtlety, for instance, uh, uh, when you see people do the Azra uh, and they put the girl on the table and cover and her arm drops out, you know, well, that's a subtlety that, you know, and, and it convinces people she's underneath that sheet, even though she's in the table and just sticking her arm out. Well, those are the only kind of things you can add to an illusion, but you can't add those if you don't have a background in, in magic because all the principles you learn for close-up magic and conjuring uh, eventually just get bigger and bigger when you get to illusions. It's the same kind of thinking. Subtleties in, in close-up magic, sometimes you don't have to do a move. A subtlety will do the job for you and that's all you can add to illusions. So you really want to have a well well-rounded education in magic before you start jumping far, that far ahead. Illusions are tough. You've you got to have 
confidence in yourself as a magician to front a box and mm -hmm. to make it. Now, I look at Ricciardi, who to me was the greatest illusionist in, in my lifetime and maybe the greatest illusionist in the history of magic because it, when he got on stage, there weren't many magic props, you know. He laid a girl on the on the floor at a levitator, not on a couch. Uh, even the the coat, the chair, and the and the uh, the tip over trunk. Look yeah. how brilliant this is. He put the tip over trunk on a table this high, because the only reason you could show it empty, and the only reason you could, is by tipping it over to show the audience, because it was elevated you know, five, four or five feet above the stage. It was a natural movement to open a trunk and show it that way. And and he applied those subtleties of Raina clapping her hands while the vanish was actually going on, you know, so there was still action. He added things that weren't there before, and those, you can only do that if you got a great background in magic. And, so, uh, are there any particular books that you would recommend uh, besides the Henning Gnomes book uh, for getting those backgrounds and getting uh, well, that? Well, uh, yeah, you know, I, you know I, if you're going to be a card magician, there's, the, you, you, I would say, uh, Erdnais, expert at the card table. Um, uh, but one of the great books, a couple of the great books in magic, uh, Greater Magic yes. by, by Hilliard. This was a book that contained all the best magic by the best magicians at that time period. And I got to tell you, I still do material out of that book. Stars of Magic, the best material in the late 40s and 50s of Vernon, Jacob Daly, Slidini, John Scarney, you know, it was their best material put into print. Yep. And these were actual routines these people made a living with. Now, there were some variations. For instance, Vernon's cutting the aces. He simplified with double undercuts the way to get into it. In later years, in Ultimate Secrets, he put out the correct way he did it with just single cuts. But basically, the whole effect was there. Uh, so, uh, Vernon's triumph, you know, this thing uh, where, let me tilt this down so you can see it, this idea of doing this and pushing in and now coming over and doing that and cutting the cards, that that was done so that the average guy who couldn't do a strip out and a, and a, a um, uh, here I'll show you, this is how Vernon actually did it. He did it, he put them in nice and tight like that and then cut them once like that, see. And uh, he didn't do this. This was to simplify somebody who couldn't do a block transfer in a strip out shuffle, yep. which is what he really did. So this was so the average guy could do his trick. And it always amazes me to this day. I know guys who can do the strip out shuffle and do it really well in a block transfer, but they still do what was in Stars of Magic, you know. That was a simplified version of the trick. But those are the books that that uh, I always recommend for cards to start out with no better book than Royal Road to Card Magic. First of all, it teaches you just to shuffle a pack of cards, and it gives you a trick with a shuffle. Mm -hmm. And then it gives you the next uh, a move with that shuffle. And by the time you get through with that book, you have a repertoire of moves and tricks. And there's never been anything else except Roberto Joby was clever enough to repeat that concept of you do this and then it adds another move to it and this and, and by the end you have a repertoire and of moves just, and material. That's natural progression through the ranks as it were. Yeah. It's a great way to learn. And, uh, yeah. It's one of the great books ever written and I'm surprised more books aren't written that way. And it's really funny because about the Royal Road to Card Magic, Whit Hayden once told Michael Benson if somebody really threw that book and looked in the back and studied things that are in that book, they have an entire cabaret act in the back of that book written yeah. for you. Lines yeah. and all. It's correct. You know, With the material people, that's in the book. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's you know, so many people claim to have studied the Royal Road to Card Magic and things like that. Well, did you ever see this? 
in the back. Where's that? It's in the back of the book. Yeah, you know, of course it is. Somebody said that to Ricky J when they saw him performing the exclusive coterie, which is in the back of the Erdnay's book. He was doing it word for word, and so many people asked him, where did you get that? Yeah, and and because and, uh, Ricky and I talked about it, I did it. He, he actually added a gag or two as well to it, you know, mm -hmm. that fit his personality. But, yeah, it's a beautiful piece already written. Yes. And people just passed it by. He didn't. He yes. saw the value, and I would never do it because it became such a, a, such an identification. Even though I did it when I was younger, you know. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful piece, you know. I just uh, it's one of those things that so many people uh, don't realize the great things that are hidden away in the books. Uh, oh, yeah, well, you know. the back of the back of Erdnays. All those great gambling moves are applied to magic, which hadn't been done before that. You know, I mean, the nobody knew what what a the difference between a pass and a shift was. You know, yeah. the shift is a mechanical version of doing the pass that goes by in a brief second, yeah. whereas a pass is generally done under a lot of misdirection. Although both Derek Dingle and Larry Jennings wouldn't do the pass unless everyone was watching him. <laughs> I, I remember once I saw him do the pass, and he, he was upset, and he got the whole audience. Says, now watch my hands. He did it a second time while they were watching, <laughs> so he could prove that he could do the pass. Uh, I'll still take advantage of misdirection any time I can. You know. Oh yes. But a shift yes. is always better than a pass because they're faster. Yes. Uh, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan Levy asks a question that uh, it was slightly touched on John, uh, Jonathan, but uh, I would ask Johnny now to tell us, if you, if you will, uh, the story about how in uh, how you and Pam met first. Uh, how did you get together and eventually? Uh, uh, you... I was doing my second convention with Norm Nielsen. My, my One of my mentors was Harry Reiser from Indianapolis, but he was living in Chicago when he was my mentor, and he knew I, I was trying to put back an act together again, mm -hmm. and he knew Norman had been talking about doing this act with musical instruments, so he said, I'm going to give you a year, I'm booking you both now for the combined IBM SAM convention in Chicago, you got a year to get your acts together. And we did, and we both appeared on that show, and that was the first time. But this, then we went on to do uh, a, a show in Palis Park, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sitting with Norman having lunch, and I saw a blonde woman with a boy about 10 years old. And I was married at the time, but I looked and I said, Norman, that's the woman I, 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 I should have married. And it was Pam. And about a year later, I was doing a trade show, and I walked in, and here is Pam, who was also a trade show spokesperson, like I was, talking to the model who worked with me. I had a model who passed out pamphlets and things, and sometimes we'd banter back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I walked up, and I said, were you at Payless Park uh, with your son at a magic show last year? And she yeah, and she turned away and looked away, and I went, oh, well, there's nothing there. But then I kept meeting her through trade shows, and one day I, I the company I worked for was Kitchen Incorporated. They, they were an exhibit house. They built exhibits for trade shows, and they also provided them with talent. And Marshall Brodeen was their magician, and <coughs> excuse me, and he hired me got them to hire me as his backup because it was too much work for just one guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one day they called me and they said, we, we were doing the Amalgamated Meat Cutters show tonight. And they were bringing in two models. One of them can work with you. And one of them, of course, was Pam. I said, I'll take her, you know. And... <laughs> uh, and then I had a job. I was working on w WLS's... Uh, not, not WLS, that's when I was a kid playing harmonica, but on WGN in Chicago, on Bozo Circus, I was one of the clowns. And they asked me to do a magic act one night for the executives, and I had just used Pam, so I used her for that show. 
And then we just kept meeting, and finally my friend Bob Crane called me and said, I'm doing a play called Who Was That Lady? And uh, I want you can have any part you want. <coughs> well, the director didn't know that I was a student of Uta Hagen's and had studied acting. So he said, well, he can't have the second lead, but he can have anything else. So I, I said, I'll play a, it was a Russian spy. But a nice comedic character. And when I got there, who was his leading lady but Pam? Mm -hmm. and at that point, I, I was separated from my wife and estranged. And so I started dating Pam, and one thing led to another, and that's history. Right. But that's how we met. I'll so get her in a room. I have a lot of hope uh, the, for Jonathan Levy that, that answers his question. Um, now, the Next uh, question is, what, uh, of course, uh, doing so many shows and things like that, uh, trying to be creative and original, uh, sometimes people can fall into a rut or a dry spell. Do you have any suggestions for getting out of a rut or a dry spell? Yeah, uh, because my wife said to me, after a couple of years, she said, uh, we're doing the same stuff all the time. How do you... I'm starting to feel that it's, it doesn't feel fresh for me. And I said, I always think of it this way. I may have done it thousands and thousands of times, but it's the audience seeing it for the first time. And because of that, I, I feel that it, it always makes me do my best to be doing it like it felt the very first time it all worked. And that always kept my energy up, realizing it's they're changing. And so I got to give them the best possible and, and try to make it better. And if you work, I've been doing this act since 19, the Tom Sony act since 1969. The birds they go all the way back to the late 40s when I was a kid. And um, I honestly can tell you, every show for me is fresh, and because I really believe it's an audience first time seeing it, so I want to make it feel as good as possible. And I don't, I don't get burned out. I never have. Very good. Now, kind of to that end, I'm going back just a little bit. Jonathan asked another another question, and more of a request, actually. Please confess. Did you ever slip Pam a stick of onion gum or blackjack gum, unbeknownst to her, during your act, perhaps as a gag or anything like that? No, I never did, but a few stagehands have done crazy things like that. One time, somebody saw, she has a little tray that Max Maven gave her mm -hmm. in, in 1980, a little silver tray with a dog engraved on it. And she puts her gum and things in there. And some stagehand <laughs> saw it and thought it was an ashtray and stuck his cigarette out. in. And she had to put that gum in her mouth and come out. And oh. She uses three different gums, you know. One, so she doesn't affect her teeth, so it's sugarless. There's one that is a special brand just to blow a bubble. And then there's the one that I stretched between my hands that was stretched out. So yeah. she uses three gums, and the guy just stuck it in there, and she came off and realized, oh, my God, I have to put this in my and she had <laughs> in her mouth. And so a few things like that have happened. There people drop it on the floor and put it back in place. <laughs> she gets dirty, you know. But uh, I don't know if anyone's deliberately done it, you know. <laughs> Although some of those may have been deliberate. Who knows? There you go. <laughs> Oh, no, and, uh, the second half of that same question was how, uh, he says on the serious side, uh, how did you and Pam come up with that Tom Sony act? Was it uh, a plan or was it a necessity being the mother of all invention? Okay, well, <clears throat> I, I, I played harmonica as a boy, and two of my boyhood harmonica friends were named Lewis and Christie, and they moved into being a comedy team. Mm -hmm. And uh, they worked the Playboy Clubs, and I conducted and orchestrated for them when I got out of the harmonica business, and I was, but I needed something to do to stay around show business. And I was still, I was also playing jazz, and 
when you play jazz, you have to have a day job. So I had a mm -hmm. day job with the city of Chicago. Uh, I worked for the sewer department. It was the only time I had a job where you worked your way down the ladder of success. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, when I was with Lewis and Christie, they kept encouraging me to get back into magic, and because uh, the harmonica thing wasn't working out, and I, I the jazz group, I, I ended up being twenty-five thousand dollars in debt, and had to close it out because I was always changing members, and it was a pain in the neck. So they first got me back into doing close-up, and Marshall Bodine saw me one day and hired me to be his backup. And, that got me working full time on trade shows, and then uh, they got a job. They they convinced me to do my my dove act that I used to do. But then they came up to me and said, "We just wrote a show, and we sold it to the Playboy Club, a review show. We wrote it on the back of an envelope, and they knew I was good at structuring, so I helped them restructure the show. And they said you could be in the show." with your bird act, but, but you got to be funny. I said, what do you mean I have to be funny? Well, just prior to this, uh, when I, they went into the Playboy Clubs, they did not need a conductor or orchestrator. There were only trios. But they wanted to keep me on, so I used to sit in the audience and heckle them. <laughs> and then they'd throw lines back and forth. And the first time we did this, Harry Blackstone was doing his first job as an opening act for for these two comics at the Playboy Club, and he finished with the shirt pull. So they would, after bantering back and forth, they finally coax me up on stage, and they take me, get me to take my coat off, and they'd say, "We're going to show you folks how the magicians take off the shirt without unbuttoning." And with that, they would rip the shirt off me, you know. And the people would go crazy thinking it was happening just uh, ad libbed. And on opening nights in nightclubs, I would then go up to the owners and threaten to sue them for these guys tearing my shirt off, and we used to have double fun with it. Anyway, they finally said, we want you to do your magic act in the show, but you got to be funny. Well, I knew I could, could get laughs because while they were throwing straight ad-libs at me that they knew, I was inventing stuff and getting laughs with it. So I knew I had a flair for it. But I still it scared the hell out of me, you know. And I went to the only guy I knew who had a comedy magic act, and it was Tom Palmer. Mm -hmm. And I went to Tom, and I said, these guys want me to be funny. Tom said, well, I retired the act, and you got a year you can run with it. He walked, went over the whole act with me, how to do it. He said, I'm going to put it out in book form, but you've got a year to run. Well, I opened at the New York Playboy Club, but you know, when you get into another man's shoes, that doesn't mean it always is going to work because you don't know what goes on inside of his head and in his heart as to what he, what's making him do things, what his motivation is, or what actors call his subtexting, mm -hmm. the reason for doing certain things. So I wasn't getting as much out of stuff as he did. But about the third day I walked out, I was getting laughs and I didn't know why just milking in it, bathing in these great laughs, and finally the drummer went, psst, your fly's open. <laughs> I turned around and zipped up, and I got a huge laugh. And I came off stage, and I said to the two comics, I'm going to keep that in. They said, you're going to keep your... Yeah, I said, in fact, I'm going to pull my shirt tail out more like a phallic symbol, so <laughs> it plays stronger. And then a few days later, I walked out, and I was on stage 55 minutes out of an hour and 20-minute show playing characters, and this was, uh, laughing was popular, and this show was built on that premise. It was called a blackout show. Every time you hit a punchline, the lights would go out, and then you'd mm -hmm. open up in another sequence. So I was in different costumes and so forth, and I actually went out and was getting laughs before, the, before they saw the fly was open. I didn't know why, but I had forgot to change one shoe. I had a brown shoe and a black shoe on, so that stayed in. Then I had a price tag, and uh, and I said, "Oh, that's too, uh, uh, you know, too overt." So I changed it to uh, it was a cleaning ticket, but I changed it to a price tag on my sleeve, and. Th 
my act is made up of about a hundred people's suggestions if I had to read and some were laymen from the audience who said gee well it would be funny if you did this some were stagehands some were lighting people some were waitresses and so I just happened to have good ears you know and I just kept adding whatever happened to me into the act and I only do three things left from the Tom Palmer act which is uh, catching my thumb in the genie tube, breaking the egg in, in the bag. The only difference is uh, we added water to it, so when it breaks, it really looks like it breaks. Water. It looks like the egg white dropping. And tearing my wife's dress off. Mm -hmm. And we actually got more out of it than Tom Palmer did because Tom's uh, wife, Gloria, and, and also Bunny, his second wife, they wore kind of a camisole and black slip and they had a black dress on so you really didn't realize much change right. but I put my wife in a bustier with uh, garters and, and stockings and uh, so a much sexier look so in fact when I did it before my wife was in the show I was in uh, a, a, a nude review called Vive Perry Vive mm -hmm. and uh, when I went in I told them about the dress coming off and I knew I had the job because he said, oh, no, she'll be totally nude. I went, what a great idea. <laughs> and so when I did it for Barry Ashton's show, the girl only wore, um, you know, a G-string. And when I tore the dress off, she was topless, and it got really <laughs> big reactions. <laughs> it worked well for my wife and I as well. But almost everything happened to me except for those three things. And then I just kept adding, and I had good ears when people would suggest things. A dancer said, gee, what if you got the, when you turn around, the, the silk was caught in your, your fly after you zipped it up. And I went, oh, that's, and then I said, no, I'll switch it for the, 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 white, the white part of my shirt tail. All of a sudden, that'll replace it like I wasn't paying attention, zipped it up, being nervous. But things like that just kept happening. And then when my wife joined the act, she just ad-libbed what she thought would work funny against what I was doing. She invented all of her own stuff, too. And uh, she's just a funny lady and a great comedian. Very in fact, her, one of her early jobs off-Broadway was in a, a, a gag burlesque show. She was supposed to play a showgirl that had a monkey costume, and, and the monkey's hands were here, you know, <laughs> the bra. And... Uh, but she could she couldn't get it right. I mean, if they were swinging their hips to the right, she was going to the left. She couldn't do the bump and grind moves. In fact, the producers used to come in and bring people in to watch her rehearsing, and they finally fired her as one of the chorus girls and made her the comedian in the show. And uh, so she's always had a good take on comedy, and uh, she just. Uh, when the first time I remember she worked, Del Rey was on the same show. And after we came off, I didn't know what she did, but Del says, does she do that every night? That's funny. And so, you know, I knew she had a flair for it. Very good. Now, that leaves us with just uh, one last question. We're just about out of time here now. I'm going to ask you, Johnny, if you could sum up all of your wisdom to give advice to all the magicians of all skill levels and all genres of magic, what would you say to them? Learn your craft. Practice your craft. And uh, try to, you know, Vernon had the best suggestion. Learn one trick and do it better than anyone. And then add a second one and do that better than. And within ten tricks, you're going to have a repertoire and a and a, a performance piece, an act. But learn to do it better than anyone. Make it better than anyone. And that's just a lot of hard work. Getting, you know, people don't realize actors have to take lessons. They have to learn how to overcome problems. And that's what you do. Learn your craft first. I, I had a young man who's, who has a show here, which will be uh, go, go unnamed. But he was 18 years old, and, and they asked me, his family, to work with him. And I, my line to him was, you're not ready yet. Learn your craft. 
here is some books I can recommend. This is, and, and I gave him as much advice as possible. But of course, he didn't listen to me, and they put a lot of money behind them, and I think they went through a lot of money, and it's still not working. You can buy a room in this town, but it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Indeed. And you're only successful if you do it better than anybody. And somebody says, I want that guy because there's no act like that. You know, that's, uh, there, there you have it, folks. That is one of the best answers that uh, anybody of experience in this industry could give you. Make sure you follow that. It's very good advice. So that just about wraps up our Q&A for today. I would like to thank all of you viewers for being here with us today, sending in your questions. Uh, of course, uh, my fellow admins for moderating the chat and Facebook. For uh, Thank you to Laura Izili for setting this all up. And a big shout out, a big, big, big thank you to Mr. Jeff McBride for helping us on the technical side of this. Uh, yeah, and Johnny on the air with us today. Good with the computer as... Uh, as a sewer worker is with a deck of cards. I may be the exception there, but I just want to thank everyone that uh, that asked questions and tuned in. And uh, we're in a great craft. Love it. It's a wonderful profession. I I've had the time of my life. Indeed. Now I just wanted to give a, another special shout out to McBrideMagicTV.com. Uh, we you go to the Magic and Mystery School Mondays. Uh, every Monday there is a show. You can click to become a member. The first Monday is free, and for members, every every uh, following Monday of the month, uh, you have to go into the secret sessions of the topic of the month. And of course, uh, not last but not least, uh, I would like to thank you, John Thompson, for being here and sharing your insights, your experience, your knowledge, and things like that with us. What a treasure you really are to this community and to magic at large, and forever will be. Thank you very much, Johnny. Thank you all. Bye bye. Have a great week, folks. And we will see you later. And as Jeff McBride loves to say, disturb, uh, comfort the disturbed, and disturb the comfortable. <laughs> have, a, have a good week, folks.